today, talking about hell, is one of those things that I, I see routinely come up on studies and surveys for one of the top like five or seven reasons that people give for abandoning Christianity. And certainly in my anecdotal experience, being in ministry for a couple of decades, it's one of the main ones that I'll hear Christians wrestling with, Christians ignoring because it's too difficult to, reg- to wrestle with, and know very little about hell, what it is, what it's for, uh, anything about hell really. Uh, or thirdly, people who have said, yeah, I, I used to believe but I don't because of hell, or I've ditched hell and I've just made up my own thing, which is my own Christianity, but minus hell. Uh, and, and lots of different kind of iterations of those things. And so uh, I try to, we, we try to as a church, talk about hell um, regularly, not frequently. Every couple of years we'll talk about hell because it's incredibly misunderstood, <clears throat> because Christians, like I said, misunderstand it. I put it to you that in a general survey of Christians in Adelaide, most Christians get their idea about hell, or their idea of hell would more align with medieval literature and modern Hollywood blockbusters than with scripture. Because we either don't like to think about it, we kind of have it in, in our understanding of the gospel, but just as a kind of slither, like, oh, there's a punishment and it's hell, but everything that we know about hell, we've actually taken from either a misreading of scripture or some non, like non-Christian person's perspective on hell, uh, or a hangover from Roman Catholicism. Um, and, and any combination of those is unhelpful for us personally in our understanding of who God is, uh, unhelpful for us in our understanding of of our own doctrine and and what hell is, uh, unhelpful for us in our um, proclamation of the gospel and certainly in our traveling with and communicating with people who have left the faith because of hell. Because if they say, oh, I've left the faith because how could I worship a God who punishes good people forever? Uh, And you're like, yeah, that's, what can I say to that? Uh, or if they say, you know, how can there be a, a devil with like a pitchfork who's just continually like punching people or stabbing people or, you know, fiery something and you're like, yeah, that's what hell is. Uh, how can I argue that or how can I help this person have a better understanding? If we don't wrestle with hell, and like, like we always say here, we want to wrestle with scripture and always lose. Like we want to be conformed to scripture, informed and conformed to scripture. Uh, informed by, conform to scripture. Uh, but we, we, don't wanna, we do want to do the work. We don't want to be ignorant of what hell is. Uh, we certainly don't want to get our ideas about hell from anywhere other than scripture. And so that's why, one of the reasons we're including this today. Uh, other people might say something like this. So either a misunderstanding of hell, or even some people do understand hell, and yet still reject the God of that hell. So um, I've heard it put this way. I reject the God who considers eternal conscious torment fair punishment for varying degrees of finite sin. I'll say it again, because I'm still early and some of you haven't had coffee. I reject the God who considers eternal conscious torment fair punishment for varying degrees of finite sin. Hell has become unpalatable to the modern mindset. The fact that there is a God who unilaterally decides the rules, doesn't consult me for the rules, uh, sets up an eternal conscious torment if I don't obey all of those rules. Uh, it's unpalatable to the modern mind that we wouldn't get a say in that or that there is a being that would treat people like this. But we can't handle it. Uh, and which is surprising, especially because um, our current generation, like the zeitgeist, the cultural, the cultural kind of age we're living in, has a great demand for justice. And so whereas Christians might be looking at hell as a source, or at least a, an enactment of God's justice, in our culture today we have a great desire for some kind of justice. And in fact, I would say more than any time, certainly in my lifetime and maybe in a few generations prior, uh, there is no space for forgiveness once the, the trespasses of the cultural uh, norms uh, has, been, has been kind of uh, done. There's no room anymore for forgiveness. 
or any kind of restitution. If you subscribe to the orthodoxy of the new priestly class, um, you, you either do that or you're the enemy of humanity. And there's no coming back. And if you don't subscribe to what I believe, then you're not just somebody who disagrees, you're actually my enemy. You hate me and I wish all kinds of harm and evil on you. And yet, when we think about God as a perfect and just being, we can't, again, in our modern mindset, hold, uh, allow for him to have the same kind of arrangement. The collective issue with hell isn't that bad people like mass murderers or rapists go to hell, but that good people go to hell. How can God send people like you and me, just nice people? What about that old the, the thing? I, man, I don't know who this nice old lady is, but in my conversations over, again, a couple of decades, there's always a nice old lady down the street who God is sending to hell. The people say, well, how can that nice old lady down the street go to hell? Who, what kind of God is this? What kind of place is this? Like I said, people radically misunderstand hell. What is it? What's it for? There are different kinds of views on hell. Let me give you just a couple of them. Uh, a liberal Christian perspective, or uh, I'll put that in inverted commas, uh, a, a liberal pers- Christian perspective on hell would be that well, hell, hell is just figurative. Uh, there is actually no place called hell. There's actually no punishment called hell. Uh, the, uh, sin is the only punishment for sin, and the effects of sin are now. And in the future, there's no real hell. Hell doesn't really exist. Or maybe, maybe, possibly, hell is just a place of refinement. But in the end of the day, love wins and... Everybody ends up in heaven with God. No hell. That is one of the incorrect uh, views of hell. Then there's this view of hell from literature. Like, it's probably the most common, most pervasive understanding of hell. That hell is a place with fire and brimstone and there's a big red throne and Satan who has a red cape for some reason and red horns and a big red pitchfork. He rules in hell over all of the evil and bad people that end up going to hell uh, and all of the worst things that bad people hate happen to you in hell forever. So if you hate peas, these demons serve you peas. Non-stop force feed you peas for all of eternity. If you hate traffic, uh, you live in Adelaide Roadworks forever, always working, never finished. If you hate waiting, you're just always in a never-ending perennial centelic line. Uh, Hell is just whatever you hate the most administered by these red, like gloomy figures uh, called demons or Satan is the big boss. This, I I put it to you, would be the most common view of hell, totally uh, unfounded in Scripture. Nothing like that in Scripture. Possibly also from literature. Uh, hell is one big, amazing party. It's just going to be awesome. Uh, no rules. All the rules are gone. I can do whatever I want to do. Completely unbound, licentiousness. And it's going to be one great big party. Again, n- nothing like that fan party. If you haven't ever read the Bible on hell, your view of hell probably looks something like this because of discipleship from our culture. It's not what hell is. The Bible doesn't talk about hell in... I mean, there, there are perhaps small elements of that uh, that have been taken from Scripture and twisted. There are even from views taken... F- even four views taken from Scripture, there's still an array and vast disagreement. So here are some of those views that are taken from Scripture. And I'd say that these are... The people who believe the former things uh, we are either... Um, do, they either just don't know, just ignorant or uh, not, not in the faith or not holding to orthodoxy. Whereas these ones are ones that people who are genuinely trying to understand Scripture, taking different ideas because Scripture, uh, because much of the language around hell is from poetic or apocalyptic writings that are figurative in nature. We have to try to figure out what is the author trying to tell us. And even some of those figura- figurative Um, phrases seem to disagree with other figurative phrases or poetic phrases from Scripture. So how are we to understand and and kind of bring these two together to understand what actually is it? So here are some uh, ideas 
from people who are trying to understand hell from Scripture. That hell is just a literal lake of fire. We see this in places like uh, Revelation 20. It's literally a lake of fire, and that's literally where people go and live in this burning sense forever. Or that there is an eternal separation. That actually the, the, the scriptures that talk about outer darkness and, and being away from the presence of the Lord, uh, that this is what hell is. It's actually a total separation from God, perhaps an internal un, uh, uncreating or internal uh, inward folding or something uh, that someone like a C.S. Lewis would say, the person is unrecognizable as human over time because of how twisted they become as a creature, separate from everything good from God. Then there is eternal conscious torment, which is hell as a place of eternal conscious punishing, uh, which is kind of where that, that cartoonish version of hell gets its ideas from, kind of a little bit of lake of fire, a uh, little bit of eternal conscious punishing, that there is a... Um, you know, the, the sound of a dripping tap, you can hack that for a few minutes, uh, maybe a few hours, but with no sleep and no rest and no food and nothing else to distract you or to focus on uh, that one dripping tap for 10,000 years or for a million years or for a billion years uh, will, will totally undo you or varying degrees of punishment for varying degrees of of finite sin on this earth or something like this. These are different ways people understand. Um, conditionalism is another way people uh, are understanding what, I what is the nature of that eternal punishment. That when people look at, um, uh, you know, after you die, what happens, that people are punished in a literal physical place of punishment and that that literal physical place of punishment is either in an intermediate state and then after the resurrection is literally in the presence of God where nothing unholy can stand or could survive and those people are entirely burnt up and have no hope for redemption, no, no further hope for redemption, no further hope for restoration or for life. Uh, these people would say that the Bible teaches that only God is immortal. We are not inherently immortal beings so when we die, we don't necessarily have to live forever in some sort of eternal separation or eternal conscious um, cell of punishment or in an eternal never-ending lake of fire, but that we own, because God is only immortal, we are not immortal, and immortality is only gifted to those who are in Christ, uh, that therefore we, do, we who are separated from God or we who are in the presence of God who cannot stand in the presence of God are utterly ob obliterated and destroyed. They'll also look to passages uh, like uh, 1 Timothy 6 and um, John 10, Romans 2, Galatians 6, uh, Matthew 7, Matthew 10. I'm saying these for the recording so you can look them up later because we literally don't have time to look at them now. Um, 2 Thessalonians 1, places like this. For today, my, my goal is not to try to say, well, this is the correct view, although I, I have an opinion on that, uh, but to look at what, which of these hells is the one that people are rejecting. Why are they rejecting it? What does that say about the God they are rejecting? And how might we, for ourselves, again, have a better understanding so that we don't fall into the same trap of rejecting a God who doesn't exist, who created a hell that doesn't exist, uh, but rather, if you're going to reject God and His gospel, at least reject the actual God and the, the actual gospel. Um, but even better than that, how might we have a better understanding of the nature of God, the nature of His creation, the nature of His justice and holiness, the nature of our own salvation, and how we might, again, come alongside other people, not to beat them down with our intellectual superiority or better arguments to say, oh, that's your picture of hell? Uh, you're an idiot. That, that comes from movies. The no, Christians don't believe that. That's not the goal at all. The goal is that we would lovingly restore people Again, I speak with people most days who either don't believe or used to believe. Uh, and one of the things that I always try to get to at some stage in that conversation is, well, tell me about the God you've rejected. Or if it's about hell, tell me about the hell you've rejected. Because I want to understand who it is 
that has been rejected because otherwise how can we how can we actually provide any help at all and again not to say oh that's foolish this is this is the reality of it uh, but again lovingly come alongside them and help them understand the truth part of the confusion for hell is a very understandable confusion again christians do not like to talk about it we have a vague idea of what it is be- from what we've gleaned from a casual reading of scripture and mostly from movies and books and literature and cartoons and so we think we understand hell because we have this kind of cultural understanding of hell and even as we look into scripture reading through scripture we'll see this word hell over and over and over again not realizing that this word we see written as hell comes from many different words that actually have different meanings that 400 years ago translators translated as one word hell and it's kind of stayed that way for a couple hundred years in fact uh there are translations like uh, the ESV and CSB, w- the ones we normally preach from, that have stopped the convention from the King James Version, the old version, uh, and they've said, how can we better translate these words so we have a better understanding of what we're talking about? Let, let, me, let me illustrate. For example, words translated hell in the Bible, you have Sheol, Hades, Tartarus, and Gehenna. Four different words that mean at least three different things, but all translated in some versions, one word hell. So how are we supposed to have a robust understanding of what is the nature of life after death or punishment after death or the second death, the scripture talks about, when we conflate different understandings into the one word. This word sheol, sometimes translated grave or pit, Uh, really just means the place of the dead, the realm of the dead, good or bad, saved or lost, punishment and relief, all happens in this place called Sheol. I was actually in a disagreement with someone online, I know, shouldn't do that, Uh, yesterday, not even thinking, like talking about this, totally unrelated, and he's saying, well, let me tell you, Sheol is hell and here's how. Listed 10 different... um, 10 different ways that she had been poorly translated hell. I didn't have time or the effort or the energy to go back and say, hey, dude, none of these are good translations for hell because all of them could be applied to the righteous who are also in Sheol, who are not suffering the punishment of hell. So when we read Sheol, Sheol's not synonymous with hell, although there is punishing happening in Sheol. We'll get to that. Hades, Sheol mostly found in the Old Testament. Hades, Greek idea mostly found in the New Testament. Hades, you might have even heard people talk about Hades uh, synonymously with hell and just a, a kind of common vernacular, maybe not common, but in the vernacular. Hades also translated grave basically means the same as Sheol. New Testament idea or Greek understanding of the same kind of place, just the, the realm of the dead. It's where dead people go the general place the dead remain until judgment so you look at places like luke 6 where jesus is um talking about giving this illustration of what happens before the resurrection but after death in this period of time after someone dies but before the resurrection in a place called hades or sheol same same place again uh, where there are both righteous and unrighteous it's the rich man and Lazarus, if you want to go look up that, uh, and Abraham's there as well. So Abraham and, and Lazarus over the one side, and this rich man on the other side. The rich man begs Abraham, let, let me go back. Let him go back. Give me just a drop of water for my tongue. Send someone back from the dead to warn my brothers so that they won't come to Hades, the bad part of Hades where I am. But he's, he's looking over to the good part. Of Hades and so Hades is not again not synonymous with hell although some translations translate it hell so it's not helpful for our understanding when we conflate these ideas uh, thirdly Tartarus only used once in 2nd Peter and it's used for a compartment or a cell in like the bottom layer of Hades so the worst part of Hades the deepest abyss, the bottomless pit, you know, imprisonment and pain, and it's where 
um, fallen angels, made four fallen angels where they will be locked up. And so you see places like uh, Jesus encounters uh, the, the, this demoniac and the demons come out and say, we're legion. Don't send us to the pit. Don't send us down there. Send us over to those pigs instead. They don't want to go to this place. It's made for them uh, where the chains are. But again, not synonymous with hell and yet in some places translated hell. Uh, and lastly, Gehenna, always translated hell. Much better picture, if we're going to say the word hell, if we're going to translate things well, much better to consider this place as our picture of hell and to try to understand the apocalyptic writings in regard to this. Jesus refers to the Valley of Hinnom, the valley where Ahaz introduced worship of the fire gods, Baal, Molech, uh, where under Manasseh's leadership, the people of God sacrificed their children as burnt offerings, Jeremiah 7. And later, as that practice ceased, uh, Josiah ruled, became a place where they'd throw dead bodies of all kinds. Later became known for its stench and death, worms. It always had lots of food. A fire that continually burned because of all the dead and rotting bodies that they were trying to deal with. This is kind of picture of hell, uh, or, or the picture of Gehenna, that Jesus is trying to give when he's giving the picture, not just of the place of the dead, not just where you go when you die, but of an actual place of punishment. This is the place we tend to think of when we think of the word hell. There's a bunch of places that talk about punishment for the enemies of God, but don't mention a particular place by name, like Matthew 7, Matthew 25, Revelation 9. But it's our job as Christians, if people who don't have a, a good understanding, or people in just the general culture who have an uninformed or ill-informed understanding of what hell is, it's our job as Christians to actually firstly believe rightly ourselves and then to help bring an understanding to others. Uh, because otherwise we are just perpetuating unhelpful uh, translations or unhelpful understandings of what hell is. And I'll put it to you that the more we perpetuate these misunderstandings, the less we want to deal with hell because it's too hard. Because we're like, well, uh, it's, it's, it's tricky. I don't like thinking about it. Uh, I'm confused because of all the confusing different things about it. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's not what we want to do. Leslie Schmucker says, Jesus doesn't only reference hell. He describes it in great detail. He says it's a place of unquenchable fire, Mark 9, where the worm doesn't die, Mark 9 also where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret, Matthew 13, and from which there is no return even to warn loved ones. He calls hell a place of outer darkness, Matthew 25, comparing it to Gehenna, Matthew 10, which was a trash dump outside the walls of Jerusalem where rubbish was burned and maggots abounded. Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven and describes it more vividly. There's no denying that Jesus knew, believed, and warned against the absolute reality of hell. And even though I agree with Leslie on this, even Leslie makes the mistake of confusing the different places, Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, Tartarus, and, and punishment, abstract of place, uh, when, when thinking about these kinds of things. This is where hell is tricky. How can hell be both outer darkness and fire, which has light? How can it be both fire and light? How can it be both utter destruction, but also have worms that never die? How can there be punishment away from the presence of God, eternal separation from God, but also eternal punishment in, or, or a punishment with eternal consequences in the presence of God? And again, we, we say, well, do we just throw up our hands and say we can't understand hell and therefore we don't worry about it? Uh, no, I think God has, has helped us. We need to make sense of apocalyptic, poetic language because one person will say, well, I read the Bible literally and it's obviously a lake of fire proceeding out of God. And another person will say, well, I read the Bible literally. It's obviously out of darkness away from God. And the problem is they're both right when they read the Bible poetic and apocalyptic language at face value literally. What we want to do is read the Bible always literarily as a piece of literature that has different kinds of literature in it. Some are meant to be taken as just historical narrative and fact. This is what happened. Some are supposed to be taken as 
poetry that absolutely is Holy Spirit inspired and profitable for us. We want to know, we don't, we don't disregard it because it's poetry. It's still helpful for us, it's still God speaking to us. Some of it is um, direct download of doctrine, like some of Paul's writings. Do this, don't do this. Live like this, don't live like this. Or some of Jesus' teaching is, is, is a parable, it's a story that tells you something about the character of God or his kingdom. And sometimes Jesus is just telling you straight out, this is how people live in my kingdom, live like this. This is what I came to do. And sometimes you read poetic or apocalyptic language, and if you try to read that literally, you will do your head in. And end up like some people with charts and red string uh, on a cork board somewhere, trying to figure out the dates of things and attach uh, modern, um, you know, uh, articles from the news to parts of scripture and it's unprofitable. I want to read apocalyptic language apocalyptically. What is the intention of the author? What are they trying to say? So that when the author both says, hell is out of darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth and hell is utter destruction where it's just dead bodies burning then we make sense of both of those by not trying to say, well, it's, it's both of those things that can't both be true. We say, well, it's a, if it's apocalyptic language, you need to understand it in the way that it's being sent, uh, uh, um, said. So which perspective is right? In a, in a sense, it doesn't matter for today's purposes. Although I personally think the conditionless position makes the most sense of Scripture, exegetically, uh, more sense philosophically, most sense of God's character today. What we're trying to see is how uh, or why are people rejecting God because of hell? And it ultimately comes down to that God would judge seemingly good people. If you're living in a pluralistic society, how, ca how come there aren't many paths to God? How could God possibly judge me who I've, tr I've tried to live a good life just because I haven't bowed to him, what kind of a person lives like that? How self-absorbed do you have to be? Totally missing and misunderstanding the holiness, the grandeur, the majesty, the utter otherliness and the justice of God. Especially people who live in the West actually have this, <coughs> have this kind of... Um, uh, objection to God that he would, he would justly rule over the nations and he would justly punish people. People who live or have grown up in uh, countries or areas where there is war or injustice or um, like significant impact, like I've mentioned my mate uh, Shedrick before who fleed his hometown and then country where there were bands of marauders with machetes who would come in and say uh, what do you want? Do you want the, uh, the long sleeve or the short sleeve? That's where we're going to chop off your arm. And then they, said, they started saying, well what about the g'day which is just across the fingers leaving you with just a thumb. Or I saw a photo, it just happened to come on my news feed uh, last night of uh, a man, stick, stick of a man uh, with a spear in his hand what a stick of a wife, stick of a child there, and the caption was a photo from late um, 1800s of a man guarding his family against predatory cannibals coming to get him. I'm like, there are peop people who have suffered significant injustice understand the need for justice. People who have been you know, round up, rounded up and taken off to concentration camps uh, and murdered by the millions understand the need for justice. There are people in our day who are living in, in the millions, in concentration camps, who understand the need for justice, who would look at an op oppressive force or person who, are doing, who has done or is doing heinous things, and even just individuals might have suffered incredible injustice, and look at the perpetrator of that injustice and go, I want justice there needs to be punishment something needs to someone needs to do something 
But because we have absolved ourselves of sinfulness and forgotten about the holiness and justice of God, we no longer have any appetite for a place of punishment like hell. Because we're, because I'm a good person, right? And sure, mass murderers, rapists, uh, dictators, okay, I, maybe, maybe we could come at that. God, yes, you can send those people to hell. Uh, but then the question is always, well, where do you draw the line? Like, who's, wh- what is the threshold of, of evil to get into hell? Where is that line? And who's like the last person on this side and the first person on that side? And in reality, philosophically, we can't draw that line. And Scripture tells us that line is actually, uh, G- Jesus is that line. Jesus is the only one above that line. There actually is no ladder. It's just a flat line on the bottom with all of us. And so who was hell made for? What is hell? Why, why would God make a hell? Um, here, here's one of the key things I want you to understand about hell. Hell is not ruled by evil spirits and Satan. They don't come and go to hell as they please. Uh, Satan doesn't rule over hell with his pitchfork on his little throne. That's not, that's not how it works. Hell was made for Satan and his cronies. That's their place for punishment, for those who reject God. Reject God. This is what Scripture tells us, Matthew 25. Then we'll say to those who have left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. These will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Or Second Peter talking about Tartarus again. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Jude 5. Now I want to remind you, that you once fully knew, that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who didn't believe. And the angels who didn't stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of unquenchable fire. So again, he's saying hell or the lake of fire, that's their punishment. That's made for them. Not for us, but because we join them in their rejection of God, and we reject God, then those who, like Satan, reject God, share in the same punishment. Who goes there? Second Thessalonians. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is, re- is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Or your translation might say, uh, they'll suffer the punishment of eternal destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all those who have believed because of our testimony, because our testimony to you was believed. So again, you see, uh, God is holy and just. What people may do in the rejection of God because of hell, they say, well, God obviously is love. This is probably more something that Christians who have Abandon orthodoxy will do. Well, God is love. I understand that. <clears throat> and hell seems unloving because it's punishment. Surely God wouldn't punish people, at least not forever or, or not in an un, unending kind of way. Therefore, hell can't be real because God's love trumps his justice. What they do is they do damage to God's holiness and his justice in their pursuit of highlighting his love. We don't do that. God is not all of these things in varying and competing degrees. He is holy, perfectly holy. He is perfectly just. He is he is love. There is nothing in him other than love. Even in his wrath, he is love. 
his, we don't pit his mercy against his justice or his kindness against his holiness. We don't do any of these things. He is all of these things. And, for the, and Paul's going out of his way here in Thessalonians to help people who are suffering under an oppressive regime to say, you're suffering, you're being killed. Remember God's justice. Remember that no sin goes unpunished. But God has a, a plan to correct all things. And part of that plan is hell or eternal punishment. Bavink says, uh, eternal death may be regarded as a culmination and completion of a spiritual death. The restraints of this present fall away and the corruption of sin has its perfect work. The full weight of the wrath of God descends on the condemned. The separation from God, the source of life and joy is complete. And this means death in the most awful sense of the word. Their outward condition is made to correspond to the inward state of their evil souls. There are pangs of conscious and physical pain and the smoke of their torment goeth up forever and ever. That's what he writes. That's the what and the who of hell. Uh, and it's, it is good and it's not good. It's good because in, in that punishment, we see the justice of God. We should see the love of God for His people in the wrath on their enemies. This is true of the first Christians back in Paul's day. This is true for us in our day. And again, it becomes unpalatable for us because we live in this time and place of unprecedented wealth and comfort and peace. In Adelaide in 2022, we are among the collectively most wealthy, comfortable, peaceful people who have ever lived. And when we look at hell, we think, oh, that, ooh, that, seems, that seems terrible to me. But again, putting, if we gain in the mind of those early Christians or anybody who suffered injustice, we can start to glimpse the mind of God in hell. And we can agree with him that, well, actually, if God is perfectly holy and perfectly just, then hell absolutely is a perfect justice for those who go there. How can a loving God send good people to hell? Great question. You might have heard this before. I have heard this before. Preached on this before. How could a, how could a loving God let, let people go to hell? Uh, the other flip side of that is the question, how could a just God let anyone into heaven? If we're talking about a moral threshold of evil to get into or stay out of hell. What about the other side? The moral threshold of people getting into heaven? Again, it's a flat line and we're all on it. None of us reach over that line with our good works, our righteousness, our morality to earn our way into heaven. The, the, the original objection to, well, I, you know, I reject a God who sends good people to hell. Uh, yeah, me too. I know that sounds disingenuous, but it's true. Me too. That God doesn't exist. There, isn't, there is no God who sends good people to hell. There is a God who allows evil people into heaven by radically transforming them, by making them holy. But there is no God who sends good people to hell, which means we need to change our understanding of what is good and maybe change our understanding of or get a better understanding of the justice and goodness of God. Romans 3 says this, are we any better? Not at all. If we have previously charged both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin, as it is written, no one is righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away Together they've become useless. There's no one who does good. There's not even one. Paul is, he's trying to drive home the point, right? 
None, none of us are deserving of goodness of God. All have turned away. Together have become useless. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Vipers' venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut, and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. For no flesh will be justified in his sight by the works of the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So saying, man, we can't do it. The, the, the much better question or much better statement than uh, I reject a God who would send good people to hell is how is it possible? How, how wonderful is it that God sends the, the sum of the nobody who reaches out for God uh, into eternal heaven with him? He goes on, but now, verse 21, apart from the law, God's righteousness has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. That is God's righteousness through, through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a propitiation through faith in His blood to demonstrate His righteousness because in His restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed he presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It's, in, it's excluded. By what kind of law? By one of works? No. On the contrary, by our law of faith. For we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. He's saying, man, everybody has sinned. All have fallen short. You want to know, again, where... We like to think of ourselves in varying degrees of goodness compared to other people. The mass murderers and dictators, their evil's up here. And me, my evil's over here. Sometimes speed, accidentally cut someone off from time to time, accidentally maybe say a, 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 an unkind word. Uh, but, but when you're judging other people, or oh, they speak unkindly. But when they're thinking about their own sin, they're back here, accidentally say an unkind word. We try to stack up our own goodness and stack up other people's badness. Uh, God doesn't see or care about any of that stuff. The spectrum is a flat line. We're all on that line. Where is the boasting? Nobody can boast because there's nobody who's good. God, the God who sends good people to hell does not exist. No such God. You reject that God? Me too. Doesn't exist. Hell is not evil. Hell is where evil is judged. Perhaps you don't want hell to be true because you don't really want God's holiness to be true. Meaning his justice is also true. Because if his judgment is real, if his holiness is real, and hell is real, that means that Jesus' sacrifice really saved us from something. Revealing how hopeless we are without him. Knowing we deserve a future without him. This would mean that we have to change our lordship from ourselves to Christ Jesus. Meaning we no longer belong to ourselves, we no longer live for ourselves, and that is not an attractive proposition to those who don't want to change. We minimize hell when we want to remain lord of our own lives. We minimize hell when we want to minimize the justice or the holiness of God. We minimize hell when we start to think about ourselves as being pretty good. And maybe Jesus just made up for, if he's, the, if he's the threshold, and I'm pretty good, Jesus just died for the little bit that gets me over, you know, over the high bar into heaven. Again, it's not how it works. Jesus saved us from hell. Second Thessalonians, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Like uh, Lewis said, those who reject God get their wish. 
Do you want an eternity without God? That's what you get. But it's, it's unnecessary. Uh, it's, it's horrific and, and glorious, horrific for those who are under God's wrath and judgment because the offer of grace is freely given, which makes it even more horrific to pay for their sin and, and, and so there's justice and it's good don't hear me say that hell is bad. Hell is good in that it is God's justice on display. It's good in that every sin is punished. Every injustice you have suffered. The person got away with it. No, they didn't. They got away with it for now. But they didn't get away with it. Because in the punishment to come, in, in God's judgment to come, every Sin will be, will be punished. Thus so again, in the long run, the answer to all those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out past sins at all costs, give you a fresh start, smoothing every difficulty and offering miraculous help? But He's done so already on Calvary. To forgive them, they will not be forgiven. To be left alone, again, I'm afraid that's what He does. To enter heaven is to become more human than you ever succeeded in being on earth. To enter hell is to be banished from humanity. And whatever perspective on hell, uh, you know, from Scripture, the eternal, uh, eternal conscious punishing, uh, the eternal separation, the uh, lake of fire, or the um, eternal destruction, it is apart from God, from whom every good thing, Jesus was the only good person. He willingly took the cup of wrath for the penalty of your and my rebellion and sin so that we wouldn't have to. This is why hell is important. It's a free salvation. Jesus bearing the penalty of hell, the penalty of our sin, it's a free gift received by faith, by trusting in Him that He has done it. See, every sin will receive justice, either by the perpetrator in hell or by Jesus on the cross. Every sin. God has got a justice. He is making everything right, everything new. I love even at the, at, towards the end of Revelation where it says, even at the end, he's going to throw Hades and death into the lake of fire. He is getting, he's making everything new. No more sin, no more anguish, no injustice. Because in God's justice, everything is made right. But please hear me. Uh, don't pay the penalty for your sin. Because Jesus has paid it for you. It's an offer to you and for you. You don't, you don't have to. Ordinarily, I would say, I run to the love of God. And in fact, I, I will always say that. I'm saying that right now. Run to the love of God. But also run from your sin and run from the punishment of your sin. That's not the primary motivating factor, but as we're considering the justice of God and considering the flatness of the spectrum of goodness of every human who's ever existed apart from Jesus, our utter incapacity to please Him apart from faith in the finished work of Jesus. I say run to Him and away from sin and the punishment for sin. You don't have to suffer the destruction of hell because Jesus has paid the penalty for your sin for you. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you again for your wonderful provision in every way. You have saved us from ourselves, saved us from our sin, saved us from what we deserve. Lord, help us to think rightly about judgment and hell. Please, Father, help us to never minimize your goodness, minimize your justice, 
minimize your mercy, minimize your holiness in some attempt to maximize your love. Father, we want to be people of the truth, who understand the truth. I want to be people who are like you in the world as well, who uh, are instruments and messengers of your love and your grace to others. And so, Father, help us in every way to love your justice, to be fruitful in proclaiming and welcoming people into your kingdom, into Christ. And may you be glorified in every sense among us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.